Quiet on set. Speed. And action. I knew it was you, Fredo. You broke my heart. You know how to whistle. You just put your lips together and... Hello. Welcome to the Foot and Friends on Film Podcast, discussing everything about cinema. Now here's your host, Nick Baylor. Uh, Welcome to the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where we discuss everything about cinema. I'm your host, Nick Mailer. On today's episode, my special guest is uh, independent filmmaker Peter Hatch, and we're going to be talking about alternative comic book movies. This is the non-superhero stuff. The Sin City, the 300, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a good show. You guys know the routine. Take your seats and grab your popcorn. It's time for your feature presentation. As mentioned, we are the official podcast of Foot and Friends on Film.com, where our motto is, any film you haven't seen is a new experience. Got a special guest today. I'd like to introduce you to him. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Peter Hatch. Peter Hatch is, like yours truly, a graduate of the Toronto Film School. He's a producer and founder of Deformed Lunchbox, a horror production company's writer, director, editor, and movie enthusiast whose day job's the local Toronto commercial scene. Peter, how's it going? Good, Nick. Thanks, to, thanks for having me on. No, definitely excited about it. Uh, now, I, um, I'd like to start off uh, with a shameless plug. Uh, which is mutually beneficial. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I really dig your YouTube channel, The Form Lunchbox. Uh, check it out on YouTube, guys. There's some great short horror films there. And Peter also works on these mashup tra- fan trailers where he edits footage together for movies in the What If universe. Uh, you did one, uh, Batman versus Jason, that was quite popular. But I want to encourage everybody to go to YouTube and type in Iron Man versus Hitler. Uh, Cause this is the latest and uh, it's awesome. I love what you guys did. And I was lucky enough to provide some voiceover work and music for it. And uh, I've seen the reactions. A lot of people are digging it. Are you happy with how it's being received? Oh, totally, man. Your, your, your voice work definitely brought it together. So well, that was a lot very of fun. happy, very happy with it. Yeah, when I'm not doing film criticism, I pretend to be an actor sometimes, so that was good fun. Uh, So we're here today to talk about alternative comic book movies. Now, John and I recently, uh, well, not too long ago, we did a show called Superhero Spectacular, where we talked about the history of the superhero movie, and uh, Lord knows we didn't even have enough time to get all of that crammed in there. We might have to do a follow-up, but... Uh, when you think of comic book adaptations uh, for cinema, usually it's some kind of superhero. You got your DC, you got your Marvel, et cetera. But there are movies based on comics and graphic novels that make their way to the big screen that are decidedly something different, usually with more adult themes and um, various elements that we're going to talk about today. Now, on uh, on Foot and Friends, I'm considered the resident nerd or geek when it comes to all things comic book related, but... I sometimes get uh, get heat from my friends who are true geeks because I actually have never been a comic book reader. Uh, is that something you are into? I, I gotta admit, shamelessly, no. I, I was never into comic books. All right, so we're in the same boat. We're big fans of comic book media, but uh, not necessarily the source material, which is yeah. fine. It is um, interesting, though. To, I mean, I didn't I didn't even realize some of these movies on this list were comic books. So it's interesting to kind of see where they originated from and how old some of these uh, series are and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there might be some titles on here that surprise our listeners that are actually based on comics and graphic novels. Uh, I saw one uh, last year at TIFF, which was brilliant, which uh, we're going to talk about, but uh, it's not the kind of thing you would expect to be based on a graphic novel. Um, I have read Batman The Dark Knight Returns. I've read Watchmen. And I've read a couple others, but other than that, yeah, I've never really had comics, uh, but I've been a huge fan of comic book media and superheroes ever since I was a little kid and, uh, you know, Saturday morning cartoons all the way up to films like the dark Knight. Yep. Um, same here. Yeah. Right on. 
So I'm gonna action just, figures too. Don't don't leave out action figures. Oh man, totally action <laughs> figures. I was totally into like Transformers and Power Rangers, and I was big into uh, WWE wrestling. And I still got a bunch of those action figures tucked away. But uh, yeah, I mean, I remember my earliest Christmas memory was waking up and just getting super excited to get a Batmobile. Oh yeah, I got the the whole uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Turtle Cave and the the Turtle Van and everything. I was I was a big fan. Me too. Yeah, I was totally. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get to the turtles, uh, and I got a funny story about that. But I'd like to start off with a film from 1990 uh, that uh, John's a big fan of, and this is uh, done by Warren Beatty. It's an adaptation of the Dick Tracy comic book. Um, I'll let you start. Um, okay, well, this is a movie that I my dad used to put on as a kid, so I, I rewatched it recently and had a very big nostalgia rush uh, come back to me because it's, it's one of those movies I, I you know you watched on VHS when you were younger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dick Tracy was a comic strip from the '30s, and um, actually, there's been lots of Dick Tracy media throughout the years. I mean, more in the early half of the century, but. There was a, like a radio show, and there was the old, um, old, really old in the 30s, like the serials, like very short uh, films that people would watch that were right. Dick Tracy stories. Um, there were a couple movies in the 40s, a TV series, radio show, uh, action figures, all sorts of things. So this is kind of like the last of the Dick Tracy, as far as I know, the most recent was in 1990, Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy. Yeah, and uh, I think amongst the endless reboots and remakes, there has been talk of trying to uh, do another adaptation. I'm sure it's, it'll be something that we'll see at some point in time. Uh, this movie has got a very, it's almost, to me, it seems almost like Warren Beatty kind of trying to do Tim Burton, if you know what I mean. Yep, because it was one year after Batman. Yeah, and I think Danny Elfman also did the score for it. He did, yes. You can definitely tell. It de definitely yes. feels very Batman. Very gothic, almost, the city, noir. Yeah, totally. And um, Al Pacino was nominated for an Academy Award for his role in this movie. And John likes to point it uh, as a turning point where Pacino got big and loud and goofy and he never came back. Yeah, d definitely big, loud, and goofy in this movie. And uh, also Madonna's in this film. Yeah. Uh, Dick Van Dyke has a small role. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, the funny, I would mention, I know John always uh, harps on Madonna for being a, a terrible actor, but in this movie, it, it's almost like her terrible acting works because across the board, everyone's overacting. Everyone's very big and loud and boisterous, so it kind of works in a yeah. in right way. Um, no, but, I hear you for sure. Um I think Beatty even expressed interest in maybe doing a sequel. I don't know if he's too old now, but we'll see what happens. But it's worth a watch. It's definitely, it's clearly a comic book movie. You can tell just by watching it. And yes. uh, it's, it's got, it's, it creates its own universe. And uh, yeah, like we said, it's kind of, it's, it's reminiscent of Tim Burton's Batman in, in, in various ways, but it's a good watch. I, I do find it entertaining. I mean, the one thing I, I noticed right away with this movie that seems unique is it's very, very colorful. Like it's, it's overly strikingly colorful. I mean, everything from the, the wardrobe, every villain, every gangster's got a red or a purple or a green suit and they've got the kind of this hilarious makeup on that makes them look like creatures almost. And, you know, mm -hmm. Dick Tracy in the yellow and every, every street corner is lit with stark reds and purples. It's, it's one of the most colorful films I've ever seen. Very stark. It, it also kind of, with the bursts of color, it's going to be interesting. I'm comparing it to something that's largely black and white, but it's got a Sin City vibe here and there. Definitely, definitely. It feels almost like a cartoon. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's a great film, but it's definitely a fun, good film. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's it diverges from the classic Caped Crusader sort of comic book movies that we're all sort of used to when you think of a comic book movie, which is, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking today. You mentioned the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. Um, so I have a funny story. Uh, as our listeners know, I am also a musician. And I, uh, my mother always tells a story about when I was a very small child, under the age of five. Um, she, I had a little plastic red toy keyboard. And uh, apparently my father walked in the room one day and he just kind of heard me plucking out two notes like, 
I don't know if this is loud or not. Yet. And it was <laughs> <I'm a theme. laughs> Yeah, it was just those two notes and and then he brought my mom in and he's like, what the, do that again. And, and they're like, how did you do that? And I said, I just listened. And then so they got me in piano lessons, but I was obsessed and I had all the action figures. And this movie from 1999, live action film, Jim Henson's Creature Shop did the designs. Uh, I watched it recently. It's amazing how well it holds up. Oh, certainly. I mean, I was actually worried uh, upon a rewatch because I, I used to watch it obsessively as a child, but I was worried it would I would watch it and it wouldn't be as good. But it, it was actually much better than I remember it being. It has a lot of heart. It ha the the visuals are fantastic. The the characters actually have depth. Uh, I mean, it's much better than your run of the mill quote unquote kids movies, and so much better than the sequels that were done to it, and especially the Michael Bay sequels that were done more recently. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's almost a, if you're a film student, it'd almost be interesting to watch the the original 1990 film and then watch the Michael Bay version and just see kind of how technology has bastardized some some uh, content. But um, yeah, and I remember when uh, I'm a huge fan of the recent Planet of the Apes trilogy and the the motion capture technology that was used for the apes in that is fascinating and that's a great example of when it works and it works so well and i when i heard they were doing the turtles and i'm like that's going to be cgi and i was i i was hoping they would kind of bring that approach to it and then i realized not all the same actors who were doing the acting were doing the voices and the motion capture didn't really seem to be you know, a big part of the focus, and then you got Michael Bay's name attached to it, and yeah. the result speaks for itself. The total cartoons, and I mean, one of the things that I, I noticed and attached myself to to watching on, on the rewatch was that there's real brothership between the turtles, um, especially, you know, Raphael kind of is the outcast and kind of goes through through some character development and has to kind of come back to terms with his brothers, and there's a little bit of a backstory with Splinter and, and Shredder, and it's it, it's surprisingly deep. <laughs> like there's it's a lot more there than I remember. So it's it's definitely worth a rewatch if if someone hasn't seen it in a while. It's more adult than you'd think. It's, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm I, I'm not gonna lie. I almost teared up a, a few times. That's awesome. That's what movies are for. Um, I heard somewhere that the original comic book version of the Turtles was quite violent and graphic. But I heard I, I don't know if I'm I can't remember where I heard this. I apparently the they're in the scenes in the panels where they are struck by the ooze and you know that, that's their origin story apparently there are subtle suggestions that that ooze is the same shit that blinded daredevil you ever heard wow. that no that's a pretty wild crossover yeah they didn't they weren't I, i'm not owned by the same company but i think like yeah i might have read this on cracked or something but apparently there was an homage to daredevil and it was supposed to be the same incident that gave birth to all those characters I, interesting i mean i wouldn't be surprised because the creators of uh teenage mutant ninja turtles I, they're huge comic fans yeah. so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they snuck that in there all right folks do your research call me out if i'm bullshitting here but i'm pretty sure <laughs> I heard that somewhere um let's talk about adam's family values okay you want me to, okay, well, this is actually, actually, Adam's Family Values is the sequel to the 1991 Adam's Family. Right. And these are based on the, uh, they're kind of like a gothic cartoon from the 30s uh, about a silly family that would kind of, they're overly gothic and they're overly dark and kind of, uh, you know, telling morbid jokes all the time. And this is another thing that's had a TV series in the 60s and it's had, I think you probably remember the cartoon when we were kids as well. Oh, yeah. uh, and they've even recently made like some CG uh, animated film. I haven't seen it for the Adams family, but the reason I, not either, no. and I, I heard it's actually not bad for kids. But I, I was working uh, at a Cineplex when it was out and I was going into, uh, you know, at the end of the show, getting ready to clean the theater. And I remember over the closing credits, they had some like, I think it was like a rapper doing the butt at them, like some version of that song. And it looked like it was fun. Uh, you know, it, it's something to take the kids to. I mean, I'd watch it. I'd pretty much watch anything. Yeah, I think my friend bought his kids to it and he said that they enjoyed it. But, you know, sometimes kids just enjoy everything. Um, yeah. But these two movies actually from the 90s are surprisingly good. And I'm glad that we put it on our list. 
because they've got kind of an all-star cast with Christopher Lloyd, Angelica Houston, Christine Ricci. Um, the sequel has Joan Cusack. Um, and they're actually really funny. And they have all these really quick, morbid jokes that almost some of the characters will say under their breath. Um, you know, it, it, they're actually really funny and worth watching. Christopher Lloyd is Uncle Fester, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, okay, I remember, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a funny scene in the second one where uh, Joan Cusack meets, um, he, she meets him and she says, oh, you're just a lady killer. And then he says, I was acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> they they continue funny. on, but it's like these little jokes that you really have to listen to pick up that they re it's almost not made for kids at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. Next property we're going to talk about, they, there's, they, there have been talks about a remake or a reboot. At one point, Bradley Cooper was attached to Star. At another point, someone was talking about Jason Momoa. The Crow, uh, the 1994 film, sadly is, is mostly remembered because of the incident with Brandon Lee, son of Bruce Lee. There was a gun prop error and he was shot and killed. But um, it's been a while since I've seen this one. Why don't you talk about the film itself? Well, I actually watched it very recently for the first time. It's been on my list forever, and it just was one of those movies, I think just the makeup or the, the name just turned me off. But I finally sat down and watched it, and I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Um, I got to say, it's I can see where some people wouldn't like it, but it's almost like a 90-minute music video from the 90s. Okay. Um, but, it, and it's very dark, very high contrast. The whole movie takes place at nighttime. Um, all the characters speak in almost like a poetic verses and, um, it, but it's totally consistent and it's very, um, it's like a revenge story. And I, I've got to say the fact that Brandon Lee died on the set of the movie, the story is about, um, him and his, uh, fiance being, being murdered and him coming back to avenge the, the murderers. And there's almost like this weird resonance knowing that he died on the set that makes this movie all the more tragic and the storyline all the more tragic. And, um, you know, maybe I'm just projecting my own feelings on it, but I, I really enjoyed it. And it's, uh, it's worth a watch. I, I mean, I'm, it's quite sad. It's a tragic story and it's totally very consistent. So it's worth a rewatch, Nick. I, I would, yeah, out. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Maybe maybe the idea and the tragedy of of life imitating art or whatever is reminiscent of Heath Ledger's passing after he after he made The Dark Knight. Yeah, totally. Like how there's this weird resonance in watching his Joker performance the same way with watching Brandon Lee uh, in The Crow. Right on. Um, so anime, I gotta admit, I've never really gotten into this. Uh, your fan. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. I don't watch all the TV series, but I'm a movie nut. So I've seen a lot of the big anime films. All right. Uh, you want to talk about Akira? Sure. Um, so, I mean, we should probably make a disclaimer. A lot of anime is based on manga. So we could, we could probably do a whole episode just on manga based, um, anime films. So we, we just chose two here to talk about two of the big, bigger ones from the late eighties and mid nineties. But Akira uh, was a... Have you seen Akira, by the way? Uh, I have not. Okay, well, then you need to add this to the very top of your list. Okay. Um, it's, it's from 1988. But if you watch it, you won't be able to believe it's that old because of how vivid and rich the, the visuals are. Uh, it, it's so detailed and so well done. Um, and the, just the, the story itself is very dark and very haunting. And it's I mean, I can't even begin to describe it, but it, it will blow your mind. And every time you watch it, you're going to find new things about it. And dare I say, it's actually a horrifying, scary film with how violent and dark and seedy it is. But there's a lot of layers there. And the, the film was hugely successful and it helped kind of popularize anime around the world. Right on. You know, I have a weird uh, predisposition to when I can't sleep, I like to put on scary movies. So, uh, and I often can't sleep. So maybe this is the one I got to put on next. Perhaps, but I, I mean, I warn you, it's the visuals in it will haunt you for years. So maybe be ready. Right, Just game. be ready. <laughs> um, you also put Ghost in the Shell on the list. Now, this was made into a live-action film with Scarlett Johansson recently, right? Yes, an uh, unfortunate uh, remake. But the original in 1995, um, based on an 80s manga, is an amazing film uh, known for its super hyper-detailed uh, painted backgrounds. 
every single frame of this movie, you can pause and look around the entire uh, background for all these little details, little advertisements, pieces of garbage. Um, it's insane how, how well done it is. Um, in Japan, it was called Mobile Armored Riot Police, which Love I think it. is a way better name. Right. Uh, <laughs> way cooler. Um, but it's also the interesting thing about the movie is it has, has really deep themes about, you know, artificial intelligence policing and becoming one with computers and really far out themes for, you know, the 80s and 90s. Um, it did spawn a sequel, Ghost in the Shell 2. I can't remember the subtitle. It's, it's a decent enough sequel, not quite as grand. And then, like you mentioned more recently, the Ghost in the Shell uh, bastardized, re I guess, reboots with Scarlett Johansson, which um, doesn't have any of the depth. I mean, it's a, it's a mediocre Hollywood film. Right. But not a, not even it's a misfire and not, doesn't even touch the original but i highly highly recommend the original it's an absolute all-time classic right on i'm gonna just talk about something right here that bugs me and has been for a few years i kind of hate the word reboot now because it's sort of lost all meaning i mean when batman begins came out and then casino royale they were called reboots and it's like okay this is when you take a franchise that exists, you know, prior or in previous media and has been adapted to film, but you're ignoring all of the established continuity, like, for example, in Batman, the Burton Schumacher films, and you're starting fresh. Um, they did it with, you know, I guess the female-driven uh, Ghostbusters is a reboot and stuff. Um, but now I find people just use the word reboot uh, for any revamp sequel, fucking anything, and it really, really annoys me. Like, oh, uh, they're talking about bringing a Frasier reboot with the original cast set to return. I'm like, if it's the original cast, then it's not a reboot. It's a sequel. So, You're totally right. It's almost just like a marketing buzzword these days. Um, I mean, and they, they rebooted the Halloween series, but they did it as if only the first one was canon and the rest of the series didn't exist. Right. Okay, the, the most recent film. Yeah, which, which I did enjoy, but it, it's just kind of like, okay, let's erase, uh, you know, two to H2O resurrection and then just kind of kind of start from scratch. To be honest, it was not a bad decision, but is that a reboot? Is that a, a sequel no, reboot? I, I wouldn't consider that a reboot. I would consider it's just a sequel to the original film. I mean, that's, I really liked that movie. And I did think it was a smart idea to ignore all the sequels. But it also came after a full-on reboot from Rob Zombie. And he made a sequel yeah. to it. So, you know, I used to joke when I worked at Cineplex, I would put um, a movie on, uh, on my name tag, which is everyone's supposed to do. You're supposed to be your favorite movie. And the first one I put on there was A Star is Born. And I had in parentheses 2018. And everyone's like, why do you have the year there? And it's like, because there's four movies with this title. Like, there are three movies called Halloween. Just yeah. Halloween. It's weird. But, I mean, that's kind of the era we're living in. And, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you've heard about this new, quote-unquote, rumored reboot of Scarface starring Michael B. Jordan. Uh, I have heard about it, and you know what? Like, I, that's not a reboot. To me, that's a remake. To me, that's a new movie cashing in on the popularity of an old movie. <laughs> you that's know? fair, but we have to remember that the Al Pacino Scarface was itself a remake of an earlier film. True. Okay. That, that and, is true. And in, in the original film, it was an Italian-American bootlegger, and, and, the, and the drug in question was alcohol. In the Al Pacino one... It was a Cuban immigrant and they moved it to Miami and the drugs was cocaine. And so if they're going to do it again, uh, you know, I think that's fine. And, and Michael B. Jordan's a good actor and maybe it'll be methamphetamines and who knows where he's from and uh, you know, whatever. Fair enough. Fair enough. I guess just for me, I, I mean, I, I would, it wouldn't matter to me if it was called Scarface or called something totally new. If the movie in and of itself is good, that's really all that matters. Yeah, totally. And uh, I just get pissed off. Like, people are mad that, like, a black guy is going to play Scarface. It's like, well, okay, it was a white guy first, and then it was Al Pacino, who is Sicilian, but he was playing a Cuban, and it doesn't matter what color the guy's name is or what his name is. Like, it's like, it's like okay, got, it's a rags to riches story. Guy has a scar on his face, makes a lot of money selling some kind of contraband. That's really all that it has to be. 
Fair enough. No, you're right. And We're getting off track, though. I'll probably be um, there day one. So who am I to say? <laughs> no, no, that's all right. You know what? These are fodder for future shows. So yeah. uh, it's all good. I, um, as mentioned, I dabble in acting. I was, uh, another story about me from when I was very young. The, the reason I wanted to become an actor was basically because of 1994 and Jim Carrey. Um, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Dumb and Dumber, and this comic book adaptation we're going to talk about now, The Mask. Uh, I fell in love with Jim Carrey and performing, and that's uh, it's been a big influence on me. I still really like this movie. Have you seen it recently? I haven't seen it too recently, but I probably saw it about, about a year or two ago. Um, now, I mean, this is one of those films that I really liked as a kid, but as I've gotten older, I've kind of fallen out of love with it. That's fair. Um, I guess just the jokes don't really land for me anymore. And the, the VF, I mean, I, I remember when it came out that the VFX were a big, big deal and they were really impressive for the time period. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, when have you, have you seen it recently? What are your thoughts? I really, you know what? It, it, it's got a special place in my heart just for the reasons I mentioned, but Jim Carrey's performance, you know, carries it as is true with a lot of his work. And for example, like the musical dance number, they call me Cuban Pete. Like I still giggle quite a bit at it. And it really was just a vehicle for him to stretch his legs and everything. I also, it, it's kind of sad for me because the guy who plays his coworker at the bank, his friend it was comedian, Richard Jenny, who I was a real, real big fan of, but, uh, he had some demons and he ended up committing suicide. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it was really, really sad, but he was, he was a great comedian. I, I've actually mentioned him on the, the podcast before because when John and I were doing the worst movies of all time, he, mm -hmm. he came up cause we were talking about Jaws for the revenge mm -hmm. and yep. he used to have an entire stand up bit just based around how stupid that movie is. So if anybody's curious, go to YouTube, type in Richard Jenny, that's J-E-N-I, Jaws 4. It, it's pretty damn hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about with the CG. Uh, I, I just, I don't know, man. I think when Jim Carrey's in his element, he, he's really watchable. And again, maybe it's just nostalgia that's uh, making me think highly of it, but... I mean, he ha Jim Carrey has enough charisma to carry just about any movie, and I'm perhaps just I'm perhaps only being harsh on it in comparison to some of his other movies. But like for me personally, I much prefer uh, the Ace Ventura uh, Pet Detective film, which, funny enough, came out the same year, was panned by critics, flopped at the box office, and then uh, The Mask came out later on that year and was a massive success and a massive hit with uh, critics. So it's just kind of this funny dichotomy for me. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Ace Ventura, Ventura, I didn't get enough love, you know? <laughs> yeah, Ace, Ace Ventura, like I said, is totally the reason I wanted to be, be an actor was when I discovered Jim Carrey. I think what I like most about this movie that I noticed as an adult, I didn't appreciate as a kid, is the juxtaposition between Jim Carrey's portrayal of The Mask and his portrayal of Stanley Ipkiss. It's actually really, really interesting when you just focus on Stanley Ipkiss when he's out of the mask. It, it, like, it, it very early on showed that Jim Carrey has good dramatic chops, and mm -hmm. I like that juxtaposition. And you don't really think of it much with the green face, that they're the same guy in a way, but I think it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's, it's required watching for anyone who, who wants to catch up on their Jim Carrey or even, even wants to study acting. It's, it's a required watch, for sure. Absolutely, um, absolutely. One, one ding against it, though, Cameron Diaz really... Yeah, she, I know. She's not good in it. Uh, and I'm, I'm struggling now to think about what she has been that good in. Um, she's the worst part of gangs in New York. I know that. <laughs> I know. I know I've heard you and John mention that. And, I mean, I, the only other... The ma other major movie I remember her from is There's Something About Mary, but it's like she kind of does the same general comedic role all the time and i don't know not not the we're not rushing to do a show on cameron diaz let's just put it that way <laughs> i mean you look at someone like Charlize theron who you know both the kind of blonde haired same age and you just compare it to cameron diaz anyways well let's, let's not get off topic no no I, but i totally get what you're saying <laughs> um this next one we're going to talk about is absolutely getting redone uh okay. 
Um, and I think Jamie Foxx is attached to Star. But uh, in 1997, we got an adaptation of the 90s comic from Todd McFarlane called Spawn. Mm-hmm. Um, have you seen this recently? Not very recently, but uh, I do remember it quite well. And there's, it's got a lot going for it. I mean, it does, but it doesn't, it really does not hold up. And I think on this entire list of movies, it's my least favorite. Yeah. Um, It's aged really bad. Uh, Even the opening credits have just a terrible font choice. And the the VFX are really poorly done, a real mixed bag. Um, I mean, if you watch it now, even for the late 90s, it feels like it was made for TV. Oh, wow. The story is confusing. The action scenes are, are few and far between and not well done. Um, I mean, there's just not much to like about this movie. Um, and I mean, it's funny, you compare it to something like The Crow, which was from earlier in the 90s, and both Spawn and The Crow kind of had this reeking of 90s. Mm-hmm. But where the Spawn is that, that bad smell of the 90s, The Crow is kind of that <laughs> good smell. So I don't know, I don't, not too many good things to say about this film. You, so what? I guess it would be fair to say that this one is actually ripe for a reboot. I, I would be, yeah, absolutely. Please, I think Todd the cool character is going to have more. I think he's going to be more directly involved, even at the sake of budget. I think that was the choice he's making that I heard. Great, R rated Jamie Fox. You know, could be good. Yep. And you know the what? There is one kind of glimmer of saving grace in this film, and it's John Leguizamo's performance as the I can't remember the fat clown character. I do remember that, yeah. And he just, he gives it his all, and every scene with this clown, he steals it, and uh, he even got top billing as the uh, on the credits, so oh, I wow. think they, they knew that he had just given it his all. It's one of John Leguizamo's weirdest and most out there, but most fun performances. Right on. Okay, moving on. All right, we're going to talk about a, a massively popular film, uh, Men in Black. Uh-huh. Can you talk a little bit about where what the source material was for this? Like, do you know? Because I don't know anything. I mean, I'm not a huge comic fan. Uh, I mean, at the time I saw the movie, I pro- didn't even know it was a comic. But it's uh, there's a I guess it's a '90s comic that was uh, about Men in Black who fight alien or help and fight aliens. Yeah, I, again, I heard, which is probably true for a lot of these kind of things, that the comic was a bit darker and more adult oriented, but. You know, they turned this into a starring vehicle for Will Smith. And uh, I I really like Men in Black. I think Men in Black 2 is pretty damn weak. And mm-hmm. Men in Black 3 was fun. And I was absolutely blown away by Josh Brolin channeling Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, Men in Black 3, uh, I mean, I don't. my memory's not as sharp on the sequels, but uh, number three did have an interesting premise. Um, where he kind of in, reintroduced the Tommy Lee Jones character. Um, but still, the first one is head and shoulders above the rest of the series. Oh, agree, uh, 100%. Have you seen the newest one, though? It's it's quite a low bar. It's quite awful. I have not seen Men in Black International, although uh, I did have some kind of high hopes for it, but from what I've heard, yeah, not so good. I mean, it has to be one of the most forgettable movies I've I've ever forgotten. So... Right on. Is, that, is, it, is, it, is it just sort of like a spinoff? It's, I mean, it's, take place it's, in the same universe as the other ones, but yeah, yeah. it's just two different agents on right. another mission, and it's uh, Tessa Thompson and Chris right. Hemsworth, and um, you know they're both fine actors, but they just don't have the charisma that uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith do. Yeah, and it's weird because, like, I loved Ragnar- Thor Ragnarok so much. I think that was part of the reason why I was sort of had high hopes for that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel like this co- the concept of Men in Black only really works the best as a, as a single one-off. Just because yeah. of, the first one kind of had this mystery. The, the first act uh, was kind of shrouded in this mystery as you were taken along with Will Smith's character to learn about the Men in Black and to kind of uncover this mystery and and get your eyes open. So once that kind of mystery and allure is gone, I, there's just not much to carry the the sequels. There um, is a brilliant, brilliant scene in the first movie uh, where they're sitting on a park bench. It's the night before, you know, uh, Jay has to decide what he's going to do. And Kay talks to him about how so many years ago, 
we knew that uh, the earth was flat. And so many years ago, we knew that the earth was the center of the universe. And five minutes ago, you knew that human beings were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that speech. Yeah, there's quite a bit of heart in that movie, especially with Tommy Lee Jones and having to give up his wife and his regular life and the, the regret that goes along with it. I mean, it wasn't a central theme, but it definitely worked its way in there and added that, uh, you know, character depth that these, a lot of these blockbuster movies really need. Yeah, and, and a great chemistry with the two leads, which is key. I mean, uh, I love when he's rocking out in the car to some Elvis Presley. And <laughs> like, you know Elvis is dead, right? He's like, no, Elvis is not dead. He just went home. Yeah, I mean, it, definitely one of the, the, the greater blockbusters of our, I guess, our adolescence, eh, Nick? <laughs> well, yeah, and, you know, the, the theme song was fun, and, you know, everybody likes Will Smith. Yeah. You know, funny enough, side story before we move on, is that Will Smith didn't even want to do the film. He had recently done Independence Day, and he didn't want to be known as, like, the sci-fi dude. Right. And uh, he actually took a personal call. Steven Spielberg called him personally and said, trust me, just do it. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Will Smith talked about this in an interview, and he said, you know what? When Steven Spielberg calls you and says to do it, you do it. And uh, I'm pretty sure he doesn't regret that decision. No shit. Uh, that's a great story. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on. This is one of those films that probably a lot of people don't realize is based on a comic book. And it's an absolute masterpiece. John and I have talked about it before. Road to Perdition. Fantastic film. Just so unbelievably good. I mean, you got Tom Hanks with a mustache, a fedora, and a Tommy gun. What else could you possibly want? Seriously, and it's it's the only movie I can think of where Tom Hanks is a villain, and also he's kind of like the strong, silent type. He doesn't talk a lot. He's not a heartwarming, open, friendly man, and it's really an interesting role for him. Yeah, and he just crushes it, too. Like, he's so good at it. Well, yeah, and he, I mean, he's it, it doesn't really emphasize this too much, but he is a total badass. I mean, he just yeah, he it, kills it, it, everybody, it, you know? It's a very thoughtful drama directed by Sam Mendes. It's not, like, there's not really many action scenes in it, but damn, Tom Hanks is a badass in this. And we got Paul Newman, Garen Hines, Daniel Craig, um, great cast. It's a, it's, oh, yeah. you know, he plays an Irish uh, American gangster in, in the Prohibition era who, um, well, spoiler alert, uh, he's a surrogate son to like the local mob kingpin played by Paul Newman, who also has a real son played by Daniel Craig, who is the complete opposite of James Bond, which mm -hmm. is interesting. And um, for various reasons, uh, Connor, the role played by Daniel Craig, he ends up trying to knock off Tom Hanks's character and his whole family. He doesn't successfully get rid of Hanks or his eldest son, and they have to go on the run. And it's a really great story of fathers and sons. Um, oh, what's the kid's name who plays his son? He's, he's, he plays Superman on TV now. I can't remember his name. I'm going to have to look that up. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, on, in the Supergirl like universe, I guess. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the Superman. Um, you know, interestingly oh. enough, um, the, the comics have sequels to Road to Perdition that follow the son going to World War II and then coming back and joining a gang and, and seeking revenge. And then his son going to uh, Vietnam War and joining gangs when he comes back. It's like the story keeps going, interesting, interestingly enough. Oh, wow. Probably. All right. Now I want to see these movies, damn it. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the first one is so great, though. And I think the, it, I mean, spoiler alert, it does kind of end with the notion that uh, Tom Hanks hopes his son won't follow in his footsteps. So maybe, right. maybe more poignant than it did just finish. Yeah, but, you know what? You're probably right. It's saying here, oh, I want to see it. And then, like, yeah, maybe I don't. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're yeah. leaving thing alone. <laughs> But, you know, the production design out of this world, cinematography, in a, in a one um, best cinematography of the Academy Award, um, just fin fantastic film. Like, it's, it's, it's a movie that more people need to be talking about and more people need to be watching, because I, I think it's a classic. I agree 100%. I, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. And Tom Hanks, you know, who's never really bad, <laughs> he, yeah. is, he is just amazing in it. And 
you know, the scene where he says to his son, he's like, this is not our house anymore. It's just an empty building. Mm -hmm. um, Jude Law also in it plays a great role. That's right, the photographer. Yeah, I, I heard a little story about the diner scene where Tom Hanks and Jude Law share screen time. There is a scene where they're sitting at a diner table or, or two tables across from each other, whatever, and they're, and they're sort of chatting. And Tom Hanks has a bead of sweat drip down his head. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's mentioned in the conversation. And then he pieces off to the bathroom and makes his escape or whatever. I, I heard that, I, no shit, that was real sweat from Tom Hanks. And he did it like on cue. Wow. So Tom Hanks can sweat on cue? He's just that good. <laughs> well, he's probably so in the role that he gets the intensity of the scene. Um, yeah, I just love that. Are hot too. All right. Um, I mean, I, one more thing about Road Perdition. Yeah. I, and I think you'll appreciate this. I, I rewatched it recently, and I have to give Daniel Craig extra credit because he puts on a Southern drawl American accent so well. He does. He, and it honestly had me convinced. And I, for a little bit of time, I didn't even know. I couldn't even see Daniel Craig in that role. So he really, he really is a fantastic actor. And this was a little earlier in his career. I believe it was before the first Bond. It was. Uh, so kudos to Daniel Craig. He, he's fantastic. Yeah, he really is. You're right. He's utterly convincing in a role that is so not James Bond. He's, 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 uh, he's a weasel and, you know, not an alpha male in any way. But it is interesting because Sam Mendes later went on to direct Craig in the in the last two Bond films, in That's Spy right. Fall and Spectre. But you're absolutely right. You watch Daniel Craig in this movie, and it's such a far cry from what you're used to seeing him play. And uh, really, is a great actor, and I think he'll have a good long career after he's, you know, hung up his uh, his suit as James Bond, which I hope is is somewhat soon. Um, I think No Time to Die is his last one. That's what he said. Okay, good. I, I am really pushing for Idris Elba to be the next one. Same here. Same yeah. here. I think he just, to, just to piss off Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> well, I also think Idris Elba, just, he has that class that James Bond has, right? He's, he's British, and he's also just got that he, he can beat, your, beat you up without even trying type of... Uh, Bob and handsome, and you just want to hear him order a martini, like totally. Yep. Totally. I love him. Stringer Bell. <laughs> Great actor. I saw, I saw a movie at TIFF called The Mountain Between Us, and it's about two strangers who, who have a, a, a small plane flight and get, it crashes and they get lost in, in the mountains, and it's a survival story, and it's Kate Winslet and Idris Elba. And it's on, the, on paper and on the face of it, it's such a, a cliche kind of not great film. It's like, yeah, we get the premise and everything, but the fact that it's those two, it just elevates it so much because they're just so brilliant. Oh, I gotta check that out. Sounds yeah, like it's great. definitely worth a watch. It's better than it has any right to be. Okay. Uh, to steal a to steal a phrase from Kevin Smith. <laughs> um, up next, we're gonna talk about Hellboy. Now, uh, there was recently a, a reboot of this, which I did not see, but Guillermo del Tormo adapted the comic uh, in 2004, uh, starring Ron Perlman, who was brilliant in the role. Um, and they ended up making a sequel, which was quite good, uh, Hellboy, The Golden Army. And there were talks of a third installment before the David Harbour reboot um, came together. I remember seeing the trailer for the reboot with David Harbour and watching it, and it was the Red Band trailer. Mm. And I remember thinking, why have they done this? How are they justifying making this movie? And then I realized, I know what they should have called it. They should have called it Hellboy, we get to say fuck this time. Yeah, I mean, it, it had bomb written all over it from the beginning. And it was funny, just the, the I, I didn't see the new Hellboy, but the trailers yeah. alone just clearly made, showed that it didn't have the visual panache of the, no. the, old, of the first two. So. I mean, the first two I, I don't, I'm not particularly fond of, but they are visually brilliant films. And I know they kind of, you can see how the first one paved the road for Guillermo del Toro to do Pan's Labyrinth. I uh, love Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, that's, a, that's an all-time classic. But Hellboy, I don't know, the character doesn't really resonate with me. Uh, I do love Ron Perlman, but... Um, yeah. Very interesting. You know, not like my favorite. I, I really admire... Del Toro's use of practical effects as well, yeah. combination with CG. 
Mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> He's a genius. Yeah, but that reboot, I don't know. So I guess there's no real future for Hellboy on screen right now. I'll, uh, Give it we'll, 10 years for the reboot. <laughs> yeah, not even these days. Yeah. Um, okay, so this next one is awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sin City. Now, this is cool because this started something really kind of unique uh it it is if you want to talk about a graphic novel or a comic book being faithfully adapted for the big screen this is the example you go with it looks exactly like the comics did and it was all shot on green screens and the comic book panels themselves were used for storyboards so much that robert rodriguez the director insisted that frank miller creator of the comic book get a uh, credit as a co-director, which he did, which cost Rodriguez's place in the Director's Guild, I believe. Well, I mean, rightfully so, though. I mean, Frank Miller, he composed a lot of those shots and the shot composition in the film um, kind of get credit, he gets credit for. So, but to amazing film. I mean, it, it, I, I went in, I saw it in theaters and I remember I, I went in totally blind. I had never heard of Sin City. I hadn't, I hadn't even seen a trailer. And my friend said, you have to go see this movie. Don't watch a trailer. Don't look at anything. Just go. He knew I was a film nut. And I, I, I was blown away. And it kind of, like you said, it opened my eyes to a whole new type of filmmaking, a whole new style. And I think that that style of kind of shooting on green screen with kind of um, more of an illustrated um, visual back, like, fake backgrounds almost led the way for movies like 300 as well. So Yes. I, one of my, to be honest, one of my favorite movies uh, and probably my favorite um, Robert Rodriguez film. And I, sadly, I don't feel like he's ever gotten better from there. Um, you know, I waited nine years for a sequel to Sin City and I wanted it so bad. And I saw it and it was okay, but it was like, you know what bugged me the most was that they didn't have Clive Owen come back. They didn't have a lot of characters come back, and they had, uh, you know, I think they had uh, Mickey Rourke come back. But yeah, no, they did. Out. They had Mickey Rourke. They had Jessica Alba. They had Bruce Willis. But like, the character Josh Brolin plays in the sequel slash prequel is um, is the same character that Clive Owen plays in the first movie. But they had the character undergoes facial reconstructive surgery. So the whole movie, I'm seeing. Um, I'm seeing Josh Brolin and I'm like, Oh, I can't wait until he gets the surgery and then it's going to be Clive Owen. And well, uh, it just didn't happen. I guess the scheduling conflicts. I mean, nine years is way too long to wait. And the sequel really was a giant bomb, like a massive box office bomb. And um, there's been, there were interviews with Frank Miller about even a third one, which probably will never happen now. No, I was waiting so long for number two and now I don't even care if they do number three, but the first one holds up. Oh, absolutely. I remember I bought it on DVD the first day it came out and it came with the comic and you could, you could read the comic and watch the movie at the same time and see just how, like you mentioned, how closely they followed it. Um, just a great movie. I mean, it, it really, it, I love how it mixes like a modern new noir style with a very modern visual style and, uh, you know, stacked cast grabs you and doesn't let go overtly violent and stylish. It's just, a, I mean, it, to me, it's a 10 out of 10. I loved it. I met Elijah Wood once in New York City, and I told him I loved his work in Sin City, and I walked away feeling like an asshole because I'm like, he doesn't say one line in that movie. You know what, though? He, he's badass in it. I mean, that's a, it's a, such a different role for him, right? Yeah, absolutely. What is he? He kills hookers and eats them, right? Isn't that his, his character? Not exactly Frodo, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, he was nice. He was really nice about it, though. That was fun. Um, so the same year, we got another one. Uh, this one's adapted from uh, Alan Moore's graphic novel, the same name. I know Alan Moore disowns any film adaptation of his work, and he won't have his name put on it. And this one does change a lot from the source material, which I later read. But I absolutely love V for Vendetta. Okay, well, I think this is something we differ on then. Um, All right. I know people love this movie. I know it's got a cult status. I saw in theaters, and I know people love it and it's now that the face the mask from the from Viva Vendetta is now like the, the face of anonymous mask yeah um so it's, it's become quite iconic but i i just find the movie i don't know a little uninspired it feels a bit obvious uh and it, i always just saw it as like a poor man's version of 1984 um, it does have elements of that yeah for sure it, it's got a great cast 
I think Natalie Portman's brilliant in it. I think Hugo Weaving does stuff behind a mask that's pretty damn exceptional. Um, he also does a distinct, uh, two distinct British accents in it. Once when his character is in disguise in a scene that I find, it's a lot of exposition, but I find it very interesting. Um, I love Roger Allen in it as the sort of, uh, this, this England's version of Bill O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. um, he's really great in it. And John Hurt sort of as the big brother, uh, Chancellor Sutler. Um, I find it endlessly rewatchable. I watch it every November 5th, you know, remember, remember the 5th of November. There's a, there's a few movies I watch annually and this is one of them. You know, I, then I, I think I, I'm listening to you. I think I need to give it a rewatch. I definitely would suggest it. Um, it's just, there's, it's, it's got, it's got a, I love the script and I love the performances in it. And, uh, there's so many bitching quotable lines about it. Like at the end when he's, when V is getting shot at and uh, McCready's like, die, die. Why won't you die? And his response is beneath this mask, there is more than flesh beneath this mask. There is an idea, Mr. Creedy and ideas are bulletproof. I, was, <laughs> I just love the, those. It's, it's really quotable. Like he quotes Shakespeare in it and shit too. I would suggest giving it a rewatch. I, okay. I will. I will. All right, let's <laughs> move on. Uh, another movie from uh, from 2005 that people may not know was based on a graphic novel is A History of Violence. Uh, you're a big Cronenberg fan, aren't you? I'm a big Cronenberg fan. I keep telling you and John, I, I can't wait for your Cronenberg episode. We'll get to it. Um, but yeah, th to be honest, I had no idea this was a graphic novel either. And this movie kind of surprised me when it came out because it's Cronenberg doing a non-body horror film. Um, and it's surprisingly intriguing um you know it's Viggo Mortensen's great and it really pulls you in with the, the family dynamic and the kind of the intrigue of how is he this killer mm -hmm. um I do think that history of violence is a little bit uh it kind of falls under the shadow of the eastern promises which Cronenberg and Mortensen yes. follow up with great movie Fan, one of the best um but but history of violence is a good fun action movie I find that the third act gets a little bit weak um it kind of turns into a kind of a banal action film but the first two thirds really pulls pulls you in and it's it's worth a watch for sure yeah and john um uh sorry william hurt was nominated for an oscar for his one scene uh, I, did, I did not know that i don't think that's deserved but um yes, yeah yeah i mean I, I would have to go back and take a look at the other nominees but uh I love Ed Harris too. Uh, he's a yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ed Harris has a way to get under your skin, and he's in a move. Another movie we'll talk about later on this list. Yeah, totally. Um, we want to talk about badass quotable movies. It's no, it's no um, secret to anyone who's read my stuff or listened to the podcast. I am a staunch defender of a Mr. Zack Snyder who yep. I think is a great director. And um, in 2006, we got another Frank Miller comic uh, graphic novel adaptation, which very much took the same kind of approach that Sin City did, using comic panels as storyboards. Zack Snyder adapted Miller's 300, which is the story of King Leonidas of Sparta and the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 B.C., uh, this movie should have just been called Jacked, as far as I'm concerned, because it is just two hours of testosterone-infused, uh, you know, blood-soaked man murder and badassery. I also think that Gerard Butler is rocking a beard that could chisel through granite. Um, <laughs> this movie made me want to work out. Like, that's yeah. just, you know, they all look like they've been on Bowflexes the whole time. Yeah, this movie was was huge when it came out. Um, did very well in the box office, uh, and it was just visually unlike anything I, anyone had ever seen. It was just raw, like you said, raw testosterone. Uh, it's my favorite Zack Snyder film still. Um, is it is it yours or did you? <laughs> uh, here's the deal. I mean, I really liked Dawn of the Dead. Um, True, that's a fantastic. Yeah, I I love Three Hundred. I unapologetically love man of steel i think it's the best superman movie that's ever been made i can hear john cringing um i really liked the original three-hour cut of batman v superman the ultimate edition which is a shame that 
audiences weren't given that version. Um, Justice League was a tragic mess, but I'm excited for the Snyder Cut. I, I re, I'm a big fan of Snyder. So, uh, oh, and we're going to talk about another one yeah. uh, in a second. Which is I one mean, uh, Zack Snyder's a very visual filmmaker. Oh, and yeah. when it comes to, I mean, action and visuals, he's almost pitch perfect. Um, I find he falls a little bit apart when it comes to cohesive storylines and plots. Yeah. But, um, 300 is an unabashed war action hardcore movie and it's full of style every line spoken feels like uh feels like bible verse it's i mean i, I would call it a classic I, I don't know anyone who loves loves action films who doesn't love 300 um it's visually splendid i, I mean i i love it i mean it's it's not the deepest film in the world but no it's it, but it's like like even the trailer made me want to lift weights it was yeah I mean, and what I find fascinating is Jared Butler, he's rocking, oh God, not just him, Michael Fossbender, who I forgot was in it. They're mm -hmm. rocking all these badass one-liners that sound like they were written for an action film, but then you realize they're actual historical quotes from ancient Greece, it's like, ready, wow. your, ready your breakfast and eat hearty for tonight. We dine in hell. Originally, it was we dine in Hades, but that's something King Leonidas is reported to have said. Um, Wow, Spartans, lay down your weapons, chucks the spear, Persians, come and get them. Apparently that's a real quote. And uh, when he's like, our arrows will blot out the sun, Fossbender just responds like, then we will fight in the shade. And I'm just like, oh, it's so badass. Again, these are all purported to have been things that were actually said during this battle, which I think is really cool. It's the, definitely the modern badass film of our, of our era. Yeah, man. It, it's like I said, it should have just been called Jacked. Yeah, jacked or, or testosterone 2000. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so continuing with Zack Snyder, I think I get what you're saying about his cohesive narratives. He's a very ambitious guy. Um, and Watchmen is a film that many consider to be unmakeable. And I get that because I've, I've read the graphic novel. And I really dig... There's, there's a couple of different versions of this. I've seen them all. And the longest one even has animated segments based on the comic within the comic. Um, I really, really dig what Snyder did with this. And I think it has one of the greatest opening credit sequences that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It is great. It, it, you know, it's one of those movies I, I saw in theaters. And when I, when I first saw it, I didn't quite uh, appreciate it. But as I've gotten older and I've rewatched it a couple times, I've really kind of learned to love it. And um, it's, I mean, it kind of gets you into the world of superheroes in a way that no other superhero media does. Uh, and it kind of rewrites them into history in a very interesting way and, and kind of shows you flawed heroes uh, in a non cliche way. Yeah, and only one of them actually has powers. Yeah, that's he true. He has all the powers. <laughs> and a blue penis as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I also love just how far out the movie goes. I mean, the en the ending and where it leads to is is rather profound and really makes you think more than the average superhero film. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting movie. And I actually think it'll age quite well. I agree. And it's another reason why I defend Snyder. And, and it's got a great soundtrack, too. And a lot of those songs are mentioned in the original graphic novel. I would encourage anyone to go on IMDb to the section um, trivia for this movie, because there are so many little homages and things in it, referencing comics and other stuff. It's pretty damn fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's an interesting film for sure. And the, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things that I, I learned about was that it, it opened in the box office pretty well, but had a very steep drop off in the second week. So it's not for everybody. Uh, it's not it's maybe not even a mass audience film. So it's it's almost a. Uh, maybe for someone looking for something a little different out of a superhero context. Much more adult in many, in every way. Absolutely. It's political in ways that other superhero films don't venture into. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on, I just absolutely love this next movie. And, and aside from the fact that it's an absolute love letter to Canada and to Toronto and where I was living when I watched it, uh, mm -hmm. Scott Pilgrim versus the world. 
Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, and you know, I'm a, I'm an editor. So as a, from an editing perspective, it's so well done. Um, so many transitions in the film, it'll transition from one scene to another seamlessly from some creative, uh, technique that was clearly pre-planned. And, you know, it really, to me, put Edgar Wright on the map as someone to watch. Um, and you know, it's, it's actually, it's a comic that's a written and made by a Canadian as well. So, you know, you can't not see Toronto in it. Um, I don't know. I think it's a fun visual feast and something unlike anything I had ever seen before it or since. And what's awesome about the fight sequences is they're like video games where, you know, the characters don't show noticeable scars and stuff and it's uh-huh. all really ridiculous. And uh, I heard that Edgar Wright choreographed all the fight scenes as if they were musical numbers, which seems to kind of make sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I didn't know that. But yeah, the, the, the fight scenes are, yeah, they're a lot of fun. And they're, yeah, you can tell it's a, it's a visual movie first. Um, it's, I mean, it's all about him trying to get a girl and then and all of her ex-boyfriends being uh, enemies. It's, it's a silly movie, but it's a lot of fun. And, it's, yeah, it's silly in the best yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, and, it, and it's no, it knows what it's trying to do. It's intentional. It's deliberate. And uh, it sets out to do it and it, and it just kicks ass at it yeah and uh it also has captain marvel superman and captain america in it i i That's love, right yeah i uh it's got brandon routh who is superman and superman returns it's got brie larson and a brilliant little performance from chris evans you know what's funny i always forget about that i always forget about chris evans before captain america and you know i he's one of the he's one of the enemy boyfriends and he's also in what was that epic movie or one of those spoofs uh, not spoof. another teen movie not another teen movie that was the first thing i saw him in yeah his career is so funny i mean he's one of my favorite actors now or great. one of my favorite stars i guess you could say but um yeah, yeah he's great and he 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 at first i was like cuz he had already played the human torch i was like he's going to be captain america i'm like i guess and now after 10 years of it i'm just like he i can't see anyone else being captain america now He's great. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, Scott Pilgrim was a huge box office bomb, but it has kind of gathered a cult, a cult status. Uh, like, you know, I don't know many filmmakers or film enthusiasts who haven't seen it. And yeah. if you haven't, you need to. And if you're a video editor or you're in VFX or compositing or anything to do with that post-production, this is the movie you need to see. Cause this, this pushed the, what can be done in a narrative feature forward, I think. Absolutely. And Chris Evans is hilarious in it. I, I, th- I love the moment where he walks in and uh, he just put, he, uh, what's the girl? It's Ramona Flowers, right? That's mm-hmm. the girl. Yeah. So she's there with Scott and uh, Lucas Lee, who is uh, the character that Chris Evans plays, comes in and he either punches him or throws him into Castle Loma or something just like right away and then looks at her and goes, he seems nice. <laughs> <laughs> he's just so over the top and ridiculous such a good movie yeah absolutely um do we want to talk about kick-ass it's sort of a superhero movie um but it's it's r-rated and it's it's i mean nicholas cage is fun in it what are your thoughts i mean i'm not a big fan it it, uh, it came out around the same time as scott pilgrim i believe it was the same year 2010 and it, to me scott pilgrim was just like the better teen kind of wacky teen superhero-esque film to kick ass uh i was not a huge fan of kick ass i mean it's it's fun but it's just kind of that middle of the road fun it doesn't do anything too deep and i think i found i find you know violent if, if violence is not is used in a weird context especially with kids it, it feels a bit off that you know or, disturbing. yeah it's disturbing seeing, you know, young, young actors, um, you know, murdering, murdering the people. shit out of people and calling them cunts. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like just, it's almost, yeah, it almost feels wrong where Scott Pilgrim tonally feels so on point. Something like kick ass yeah. doesn't uh, really, um, well, let's know, move on then. Cause yeah. this, this next one is a collaboration between Peter Jackson and Steven Spielberg. I love oh, this movie. Adventures in Glad Jackson. you love it, Nick. Cause it's not enough people have seen it. Oh, I love it, man. And, and you know what? Uh, no, I'm the biggest Andy Circus fan in the world. So, <laughs> like, that that right there gets me in the seat. But, yeah, man, uh, 
I remember Spielberg, I think he won the Golden Globe for Best Animated Feature or something, and he he thanked Andy Serkis, the man of a thousand digital faces. You got quite a cast in this. Uh, this movie just is awesome and gorgeous to look at. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't, have we even told the audience what movie we're talking about yet? Yeah, I said, The Adventures of Tintin. Adventures of Tintin. So, was, sorry, was Andy Serkis in this? He's Captain Haddock. I did not know that. Yeah, and he's the drunk. Wow. Okay. That just, I mean, it makes sense. I, I mean, this movie is, is, is just amazing. And the thing that kind of blew me away was, I mean, I, I remember Tintin um, kind of growing up as that cartoon that I never really wanted to watch. Same here. Um, and it's actually a French comic that goes back to the 1929. So it's very old and, and popular in France. Uh, and is it Belgian French? I, I thought it would French, make... but from I think it's the French language speaking people from Belgium. I, I don't okay. know. Okay. That. Um, well, European nonetheless. All right, fair enough. Um, but it's it's too bad this movie wasn't more popular because I think it's one of the best uh, fully animated movies ever. Um, and it's Steven Spielberg's. I believe it's his only fully animated film he's ever directed. Oh and, yeah. Yeah, and, and from beginning to end, you feel Spielberg throughout the movie because every shot, you know, the the way he moves the camera, the way the 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 scenes play out, it, and the way the shot composition is, it's pure Spielberg, and it's the movie never ever bores you or or lets you go. It grabs you and doesn't let go. Um, the animation is superb. Uh, it's got one of the best one take uh, action scenes uh, in the final act. And um, I've got to say, um, one of the most amazing things about it is that um, it was supposed to have a trilogy, or sorry, supposed to have a trilogy, but didn't. But the movie still feels self-contained as a true Tintin mystery. I feel like a lot of animated films, especially, try to do this whole save the world, stop the evil, kind of going too big for their own good. And it, it contains itself within a nice, you know, a nice French mystery. Um, yeah. Find the treasure kind of thing. I, I love it. Yeah, it, it was so. This movie was produced by Peter Jackson and directed by Steven Spielberg. The original idea was that a second film would be produced by Steven Spielberg, directed by Peter Jackson, and then the third one would be a full collaboration from start to finish with both. I guess the box office didn't do well enough, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen, which is sad because I really, really liked this one. It's too bad, and I, I mean, you know, so many people I talk to have never seen it, and I'm always raving about it. it there's just I think there's just not an allure to people to see to see it. I don't know what what I don't know why. I'm glad you I'm glad you love it as much as me, Nick. Because oh it's, yeah, it, it's great. I love it. It's oh, yeah. uh, and you're right. You just feel pure Spielberg from start to finish. Fantastic film. Yeah. Uh, I'm, let's talk about. Uh, do you want to talk about Judge Dread or just Dread or both? <laughs> um, I think maybe more Dread because the 1995 Judge Dread isn't. There's not too much to say about that. Yeah, still love. Um, it's interestingly, it's a late '70s British comic that it's based on, um, and I mean, it's an interesting setting. It takes place in the the late future, I think the 2080s, where the Earth is is uninhabitable except for major cities, and these these judges have the right to, to you know to be judges, jury, and executioners. They're basically like god cops. Right. And they kind of fight this rampant futuristic crime. Um, the 1995 film was rather cheesy. You know, it starts Stallone. It was a flop and got panned. And, you know, unfortunately, this 2012 sequel just called Dread is maybe one of the most underrated action films I've ever seen. It's, it's really, really good. And like you said earlier, it's better than it has any right to be. Yeah, it's really good. And Carl Urban's totally doing the Batman voice and he doesn't show his face, but it it's dark and badass and adult and they stayed true to the comics. And uh, yeah, I really liked it. I, I, again, like the fact that it stays contained. Uh, it doesn't try to save the world or stop, you know, the evil gods of the, the netherworld. It's a contained story. It takes place in one, I believe, like a condominium where Dredd has to take out a drug lord, and the, and the whole movie takes place in this one condo, uh, and it just it just never lets you go. And it's vi visually fantastic. There's this drug they do in the film, and it kind of makes everything go into like this hyper, sparkly slow motion. Um, yeah, this movie does not get the credit it deserves. And if, if someone hasn't seen Dredd, uh, I think we, I just call it Dredd 2012, you need to stop everything you're doing and watch it. It's so good. Totally. Um, 
I'm going to let you talk about this next one because I haven't seen it, Snowpiercer. Okay, well, your boy uh, Captain America's in it. So I know, I love that. Kind of the list. Uh, very interesting film. It's based on a French graphic novel called, I might say this wrong, Transpersonage. Sounds uh, right. <laughs> it's yeah, it's um, uh, directed by ba uh, Bong Juno, which is uh, the director of the most recent Parasite. One oh, of the I didn't realize. Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting because the movie uh, deals with classism, and it seems to be something that Bong Joon Ho is, is you know, that's really his kind of directorial vision is tackling this class issue. But it's an interesting setting where the global warming has heated the earth beyond, uh, you know, beyond the point of livability. And so humans decide to release this chemical in the air to cool it down and ends up freezing the entire planet. And the last remaining uh, humans are on this kind of endlessly running train. And it's, um, you know, it's a sci-fi film, but because it's in a contained setting, it's, you know, they're able to keep the budget down. And it's really about these people in the, the back car of a train, kind of like the, the lower class, the poor people who run the, the engines, uh, fighting to rise up. And they're kind of uh, Chris Evans character among the, these, um, you know, the low class train goers kind of uh, work their way to the front of the train to, to see what's going on to get to fight for their rights and it's a really interesting film it's it's a little cartoony but um it's got a lot of deep themes there and you know it's a little bit of a spoiler but uh ed harris is actually the at the front of the train oh, nice. and he, he's got a great single scene at the end where he kind of unloads on chris evans all this truth and it's, it's, I don't even remember it being in theaters, but it's definitely an underrated sci-fi gem. And uh, you need to see it, Nick. It's good. It's good. All right. I will add it to the list. Um, yeah. We recently did a show on Tom Cruise, uh, who John and I both love. And we talked about uh, this film based on the Japanese graphic novel, All You Need Is Kill, uh, Edge of Tomorrow. This movie's badass. Yeah, it is badass. And it really surprised me. Like, I did not expect it to be as good as it, it was. Um it's kind of like Groundhog's Day. And I think you, I know, I remember listening to you guys talk about it, but it basically is Groundhog's Day, the sci-fi action version. Yeah, totally. Uh, I came met with strong reviews, uh, did really well in box office. I think they're talking about a sequel. They are. Uh, it's happening. It is happening. Great. Is it, is Emily Blunt going to come back as well? I believe she is. Yeah. Great. So the premise is Tom Cruise plays this military general. He's not really used to seeing uh, battle on the field and, and there's a war with these aliens and stuff and he gets touched by one of them and he dies and then he wakes up and he starts repeating the same day over and over and over again trying to you know exactly it's like Groundhog Day but with a whole lot more badassery going on yeah it's a fun movie I mean if I can levy one complaint about it I find the the last acts or the kind of the climax a little weaker than the first two acts but um, still a great fun movie yeah, it is. And uh, I'm excited for a sequel. Uh, it's no secret to our listeners that I'm a massive fan of Taron Edgerton. Uh, I think the work that he did as Elton John in Rocket Man should have gotten him the Academy Award for Best Actor, but he wasn't even nominated. Subject for another show. But, I definitely agree with you there, by the way, 100%. Nice. Yeah. I liked Joker. I hate that I like it, but anyway, we've talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, Matthew Vaughn, who did Kick-Ass, and he did X-Men First Class, he adapted this comic book, uh, Kingsman, The Secret Service. Uh, for the, Those were two films made. First one came out in 2014, and it kind of did what Kick-Ass did to superheroes with James Bond and, like, old spy films. It jacked it up and made it really violent and, and modern and R-rated. Uh, are you a fan of these films? Um, I'm not going to lie, I haven't seen the sequel yet. Oh, but, all right. Um, I did enjoy the first one. I didn't love it, but I, I thought it was a, definitely a fun movie. And, uh, you know, tons of charisma from Taron Egerton. And, um, sorry, who is the other actor he plays with? It's not, it's not Kevin. Uh, um, oh, my God. It escapes what? me. He's from King's Speech. Colin uh, Firth. There Colin it is. Firth. Yeah. yeah. They have so much charisma together. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, these mo the movies. So I enjoyed it. I really had no idea it was a comic until this podcast. Yeah, I think it plays pretty fast and loose with the source material, but I don't mind that. Uh, and plus, seeing Colin Firth kick the shit out of somebody is really, really fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a fun and well-made movie. It doesn't feel all that original. It's kind of the typical um, 
male power fantasy of finding out your set for greatness <laughs> but, yeah uh, totally it's a it's a fun movie i mean so you've seen the sequel is it how is it it's good i think it, it holds up to the original elton john actually has a cameo in it as himself no kidding okay yeah which is where him and edgerton met uh, and i think it's what got him uh <laughs> the gig for rocket man um it's it's good and uh, it's got uh, the American co- um, counterpart to the Kingsman, the Statesman, and you got okay. Jeff Bridges and Channing Tatum and, and stuff. Uh, it, it's fun. I mean, if you like the first one, I can't imagine you wouldn't like the second one. Yeah, they're fun. It looked fun from the trailer. I mean, it, they're just the action scenes are well done. Um, yeah, it's a, definitely a fun, fun film. But I, I do think Taron Egerton... He's got some real potential. He's got some real chops. I think uh, I'm excited to see what he does going there's, forward. There's, there are fan petitions to have him play Wolverine in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I'm all for it. Oh, yeah. I think he he's a natural fit after Hugh Jackman, for sure. All he, he needs is the mutton one. chops, and he'll hit the gym, and he'll be good to go. He's got that kind of uh, strong jaw going for him, you know? So. Totally, totally. The only flaw in Rocket Man is that Taron Edgerton is too handsome to play Elton John. That's the only flaw in that movie. It's true. They added that space in his teeth, though. But didn't yeah, do- yeah, yeah. And they, they, they put his hairline back. Um, I'm really excited to see what he does in the future because I think he's brilliant. Same here. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. And uh, the last film we're going to talk about, I, I mentioned it earlier, I saw this at TIFF, it's, it's yet to be released, it's called Radioactive, and it's the story of Mary Curie, um, not your typical kind of inspiration for a comic book or a comic book movie, but I loved this film, it shows, uh, it, she, Mary Curie is played by Rosamund Pike, and uh, who is brilliant in the movie. And it shows her uh, story meeting her husband, Pierre Curie, and their discovery of radium and all that. But it's juxtaposed with these flashback forwards in time to the site of the Chernobyl disaster and the dropping of the atomic bomb and uh, all, you know, the, the, the far-reaching consequences of her scientific discovery and what happened. I think it, it's brilliantly acted by Rosamund Pike. Um, it's directed by Marjorie Satrapi, uh, Satrapi, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, because it was, it was uh, premiered as the closing night gala at the 2019 uh, Toronto International Film Festival, it, um, it was scheduled to be released by Amazon Studios on the 20th of March uh, in the UK and April 24th in the US, but because of the COVID thing, it's, it's been delayed. I'm excited to see this release and see how it does, because again, it's an unconventional comic book sort of movie, like kind of like Road to Perdition was, but I found it uh, compelling as hell. I would really recommend it. Is it like an action movie? Or no, something? not at all, not at all. The, the, co- the kind of action, is you see it on a uh, sort of a molecular level and you see the elephant's foot from inside the Chernobyl nuclear plant and and those scenes are kind of where the adrenaline comes from but other than that it, it's sort of a straight up biographical film of uh, Ma- Maria Curie. Great I mean I, I love Roseman Pike I feel like she's one of the most underrated actresses uh, around so this is definitely on my radar. Yeah, for sure. I would highly recommend it. It might have been my favorite thing I saw at TIFF last year, which is, is surprising. Wow. But uh, I would definitely check that out. Um, so we've we've gone through our list. Uh, are there any other ones that should be mentioned? Or, or what do you think? I mean, I'm sure there are. Like you said, so many of these movies I didn't even realize were based on comics or graphic novels. Yeah, uh, they're films like American Splendor, you know, which is based on a comic book. Really? Okay. Yeah, uh, but um, well, let's 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 throw it to the audience. Is there anything we missed? Is there anything we should have talked about? Hit us up on social media. Let us know. Uh, we're happy to do follow up shows, and uh, be sure to please check out Deformed Lunchbox uh, on all platforms of social media. Check out their YouTube channel. Uh, go to YouTube. Check out Iron Man versus Hitler. Uh, and I'd like to once again thank our guest Peter Hatch for being with us today. Pete, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It was an honor.
There you have it, folks. Episode number 30, Alternative Comic Book Movies, with our special guest, Peter Hatch. I'd like to thank Pete for being on the show. Once again, check out Deformed Lunchbox on YouTube and all the social media platforms. Come visit us on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, puttingfriendsonfilm.com. Go to our YouTube channel, click like and subscribe for all of our podcasts. Until next time, we'll see you at the movies. We'll be right back.